Uh, this section will start with a trio of lightning talks about diversity in EA. Our first speaker is the co-founder uh, and international director at Animal Equality. I'm Jose Valle, uh, co-founder with Sharon Nunez and Javier Moreno of uh, Animal Equality. And um, I also run the investigations department. And uh, I want to ask how many of you know uh, Animal Equality? And um, we started in 2006 in Spain, and uh, shortly after we became an international organization with groups in Colombia and Peru and Venezuela. And um, in, in the 11 years that we have been working, we have expanded to eight countries. We work in the US, in Mexico, in Brazil, in India, Italy, Spain, uh, Germany and the UK. Uh, we focus our work on uh, farm animals because it's the largest number of animals and the uh, largest amount of suffering caused by humans. Um, so we focus on, on that type of uh, interventions. And we carry out uh, investigations into factory farms and slaughterhouses. We have educational programs where we show the footage from these investigations and we um, distribute booklets and other materials to students in universities in all these countries. We also carry out corporate outreach campaigns where we approach corporations, uh, trying to get them to commit to ban uh, the extreme forms of confinement of hens who are kept in battery cages in the size like this, more or less. Um, 6K hens have spent their whole lives unable to spread the winds. And so far in the last six months, we got 22 companies to pledge to that, affecting over 12 million hens every year. We also work on uh, legislation in some countries, like uh, Mexico and India, and then in regions like uh, in Europe. And I'll talk a little bit more on that later. Um, when we started, it was only three of us, uh, three advocates, very, very committed with a common vision of what we wanted to do, but with no little resources. And as you can imagine, Spain is not the best place to start an animal rights organization. Uh, even the, now, although things have changed, but back then it was very, very difficult. And um, so one of the first things that we did is we decided to, the three of us, to uh, live together and share our income. So one person will be working full time at some type of job and the other two um, will be able to dedicate more time to activism. We thought that that uh, sacrifice was needed in order to be able to work more for animals. Otherwise, if we have other type of jobs and we can only dedicate our spare time to the animals, it wouldn't be possible to grow an organization and become effective. And that, I think, proved to be a very uh, good decision. Um, after uh, these 11 years, we are now a team of 60 people in eight countries. Um, since we started, we didn't want to be limited by the country where we were born or the country where we uh, were raised. So we immediately had this international approach. And uh, it is certainly true that the animals don't care in uh, which animal they are. They only care about the suffering they are experiencing. So um, we thought about this and we decided to uh, expand soon to uh, the UK where we hired two people. And uh, we started establishing connections with advocates in other countries, especially in Latin America, because of course, the, using the same language, Spanish, and in Spain, uh, it is still very influential in the Latin American countries. So uh, that has um, shown um, very effective uh, in these years. We have noticed the influence that uh, our activities have had in, in Latin American countries. Um, we started attending conferences, for example, in Norway in 2009, learning from other advocates and applying those same tactics and strategies to our work. That's, for example, when we learn about uh, the investigations into factory farms and slaughterhouses and started to do the same uh, in Spain. 
Animal Equality is uh, considered a standout charity by animal charity evaluators. Um, you can go into the website and read the review. Um, and according to them, um, for every dollar dedicated to our investigations department that I run, we spare 11 animals from a life of misery. That translates into 2.8 years of suffering spared per dollar. And as an organization as a whole, it's 4.9 animals per dollar and 1.2 years of suffering is per. Um, I think these numbers are, uh, are really uh, interesting and it shows how uh, effective an organization dedicated to spare the suffering of animals can be. Um, for example, in our corporate outreach department, we just started six months ago, uh, we dedicated about 100 and $40,000 affecting to over 12 million hens every year uh, with a significant decrease in the amount of suffering for each of those animals. When we started, we were not focused on farm animals. Uh, we were dealing with all types of issues like bullfighting, uh, hunting, fur farms, uh, you name it, vivisection, etc. And this is a demo that we did like suspending ourselves from the bull ring. Uh, we were also jumping into um, bull, bull fights, disrupting the killing of the animals. We're chaining ourselves to uh, four stalls, doing all kinds of things. Because we look at, uh, for example, what Greenpeace was doing for the environment and we thought if we do these type of actions for the animals, people will make the connection and understand that this is also a, worth, uh, a topic uh, or an issue worth of consideration. Because of these type of actions, we gather, uh, we obtain a lot of media attention and advocates from all over the world start to uh, learn about the type of work that we were doing. But um, we had the problem that we were showing, for example, footage of um, farms and slaughterhouses in Spain to the people. We understood how important it was to educate the public on that. But, uh, they were saying, the public was complaining that this footage, it only happens in the US, it's not from the US, Spain. So um, we had to go start going into these places and get these images ourselves. And the idea was helping people to make the connection between the, between the individual animal, the process that then the industry, and the final product that ends in their uh, plates. More recently, uh, we carried out investigations into 70 um, rabbit farms and forest slaughterhouses in Spain and Italy. And we work with uh, uh, European parliamentarian Stefan Eck to introduce an initiative with uh, also Compassion uh, in War Farming work on that uh, to get uh, rabbit cages banned in the whole Europe. That affects over 340 million rabbits every year. Also, so these investigations that we have been carrying out and learning from other groups in other countries have been used and there is a currently a campaign to ban the mutilations of pigs, like cutting the teeth, cutting the tails, or castrating them without anesthesia, which we can all understand that it causes extreme pain to these animals. And uh, lately, we have also been working on Mexico. Uh, we visited 31 slaughterhouses. Uh, we filmed in 21 of those. I personally visited six of those. And the, uh, in most of them, they were killing the animals without any uh, stunning method, which of course, it causes extreme suffering to these animals. And we work with the main political party in the government, which is the PRI, and the Senator Diva Gastelum to introduce an initiative that will make it illegal. Um, this type of behavior and it will make uh, animal abuse and killing animals without a stunning um, felony crime punished by up to four years. And it covers all types of animals uh, and including farm animals and including chickens and some others. I want to comment on, and I have touched briefly on some of the benefits uh, with some examples of working internationally and growing an organization internationally. But um, in our experience, uh, I want to highlight some of those. Um, for example, 
the sharing resources, sharing the materials that we produce, uh, it's a way of becoming a more efficient organization. We don't need to design a uh, material, a leaflet, uh, a website again for every country. We just design it once and then translate it and adapt it. So that's uh, one of the benefits. Sharing the knowledge, like we, held, uh, we hold um, meetings every week where people share in, within their department across countries all the knowledge. It can be within the communications department, it can be in development or in corporate outreach. We also invite the speakers from our activists from other organizations to share the knowledge. Um, and we see that this is uh, very, very um, effective and very uh, positive for the organization. Having a team in eight different countries it also brings a uh, diversity of views that we think it enriches the organization and the work that we do, it allows us to think about these topics in a, uh, from different angles and think of uh, tactics or activities that we haven't uh, thought about that. It also allows us to reduce costs. For example, we hire some staff in countries like uh, Mexico or in India where uh, wages are typically lower, and our staff there, they have a decent wage, they can have a, you know, a good uh, life, but it's still, compared to the US, is just a fraction of that. So um, all our uh, graphic designers and video editors are based in Spain, for example, and we uh, will continue doing this. Some other benefits of running an organization internationally and growing these uh, this project uh, in these other countries is that some countries, because of the limitations or because of the cultural differences, um, they don't have much potential for fundraising, like uh, maybe in India or Mexico, while some other countries, like in the US or uh, Germany, it is much easier to fundraise. And, uh, so we don't care where we get these funds from, we decide to allocate them where uh, we think it makes the most difference. So for example, all the work that we uh, do in Mexico, we currently have six uh, staff full-time in, uh, in an office and we carry out a number of programs there. All of that is funded from the US. So I think that's another big, big uh, benefit of uh, running an you know, organization internationally. And uh, all these translate, I think, into uh, increased efficiency because we are reducing the cost and we can uh, transfer funds where it's most needed and also to areas where we can get the higher impact. Like in Mexico, for example, that initiative will affect all animals, while uh, maybe in the US it wouldn't be possible something like that at a federal level at this moment. Of course, all this comes with uh, its own challenges. We work in its five different time zones. Uh, all the cultural differences, the different languages. Um, it also requires us to dedicate far more time to um, align everybody within the organization with uh, our common vision. But we think it is very worthy. We meet a video conference every month and we meet face to face on meetings every six months. Um, so uh, this is the work that we have uh, very briefly uh, carried out in the last uh, months and how, how we have grown this organization in the last years. And I would love to take your questions. Unfortunately, we actually don't have time for questions uh, before we have the next lightning talk, but do you have office hours or will you be available for questions yeah. afterward, after this? Uh, sure. Yeah, we'll be at the um, Animal Quality booth over there. All right. Yeah. Jose will be available for questions at any time at his booth. Thank you so much, Jose. Thank you. Our next speaker on diversity in EA is Georgia Ray. Uh, Georgia Ray is a research associate at Wild Animal Suffering Research. She helps run the Seattle Effective Altruist Group. She writes about a variety of topics, including animal welfare and ex existential risk, at eukaryotewritesblog.com. She has done research on bacteriophage host interactions and graduated from the Evergreen State College with a focus on microbiology. Please welcome Georgia.
Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to talk to you about wild animal suffering, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, diversity. Okay, so there are obviously a, a social, moral, um, a lot of reasons we might care about diversity. I'm going to tell you about um, only one of these aspects, which is uh, how it affects the performance of teams. Uh, I'm mostly going to be referring to demographic diversity, so age, race, gender, culture, um, as well as some other things like uh, educational background. Um, obviously, there are more kinds of diversity than these, and also, obviously, all of these have uh, somewhat different effects on teams. Um, but it does turn out that if you treat them as sort of facets of this one thing, diversity, uh, then some interesting things fall out, which I'll tell you about. Um, I'm also going to be referring to, or uh, drawing from um, reviews of large numbers of teams, uh, meta-analyses, uh, experiments um, in a business context, but I believe that they'll apply to EA organizations, local groups, uh, research teams, that kind of thing. Uh, interestingly, the research doesn't show, or uh, the research shows that um, diversity's effect on team performance is uh, overall, like for a, a random team, is uh, very unclear. It's not necessarily positive or negative. Uh, that's my lightning talk, thanks for, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> what actually happens is if we look at this a little further, um, we can decompose it into two effects. One where its effect is mostly positive on team performance and one where, one where it's mostly negative. Um, let's start off with the aspect where it's mostly negative, which, um, I'm go which uh, I'll lump under the banner of um, social categorization. This is our tendency as humans, mostly completely unconscious, uh, to have an in-group and an out-group. And we like our in-group and we're not so sure about that out-group. Um, diverse teams tend to have worse communication, be less cohesive, have more conflict of both productive and unproductive varieties, uh, and of course they'll start fall, uh, biases start coming up. Um, people in the team will unreasonably dismiss other people or think that they believe things that they don't actually believe. Uh, these kinds of things come into play. On the positive side, we have this um, other factor, or this other factor, which I'll call uh, information processing. Diverse teams tend to be more creative, more innovative, better at solving problems, um, better at analyzing information. One experiment actually suggests that the amount of gender diversity on your team is better, uh, the, yeah, the, degree to, uh, the amount of gender diversity is um, better correlated with how good your team is at problem solving than the IQ members of anyone on the team, which is kind of a strange result. Um, it's very powerful. Uh, the theory goes that um, even for sort of surface, well, even so, for sort of obvious uh, forms of diversity like gender or race, these things do actually correlate to different lived experiences uh, and then to um, different information you have or different cognitive tendencies. So diversity can be thought of uh, as a resource for information processing uh, that you can draw on all these different kinds of things. Yeah, so we've identified this sort of uh, positive effect in this sort of um, effect where it's mostly negative on performance and we like optimizing things. So how do we get less of the bad thing and more of the good thing? Um, yeah, let's start with reducing the harm from social categorization or reducing the, the uh, degree to which this happens. We know that having more, div uh, more representation along any particular axis of diversity makes social categorization much less of a thing. So for instance, if you have one woman on your five person research team, then that social categorization might kick, is going to kick in pretty strong. If you have five women on your 10 person research team, uh, now we're talking, you're much more likely to see strong positive effects from that. We know that teams that work remotely are less susceptible to gender bias and probably other forms of uh, bias as well, presumably because you like that's less salient when you interact over, say, a Slack channel. You're not looking at someone all the time. And uh, fortunately, as we, or uh, finally, as we might hope, um, we find that teams that have stayed together for longer um, are much less uh, have much less of this sort of social categorization going on for obvious differences. Um, They'll recognize like deeper cognitive differences a little more, but not necessarily in a bad way. Um, you know, you start to know people, maybe you start seeing the team as more of your in-group, and uh, diverse teams that have been together for longer basically reliably outperform non-diverse teams. And then we have this uh, resource from information processing, and how do we extract more out of this resource? Uh, the first step is to have diversity at all. That's, that's like number one, that's really important. Um, but once you have some diversity on your team, how do you get more out of this? Um, we, it seems like since a lot of the benefit for information processing is this, um, this, it's this work of, um, recognizing difference of opinion 
and uh, acknowledging that different opinions are present and sort of digging into that and questioning your own beliefs. Um, so people who are more likely to spontaneously do that work, groups of people who sort of enjoy that, are much more likely to get benefits out of it because they actually do that work. Um, unfortunately, I don't know of any groups of people that like analyzing information and questioning their own beliefs, so good luck with that, everyone. <laughs> And we also find uh, that there's this other fact, this factor called uh, a positive diversity mindset, which means that your team has an accurate understanding of how diversity might help them for their particular work. Not just in general, it has to be for what they're working on. Um, obviously, the exact details of like how this will benefit them is going to vary, vary depending on the work you're doing. So it seems so. Um, your team can either perhaps uh, brainstorm ways that diversity might help them, in which they're likely, in which case they're going to get more out of it. Or I was also able to look online and very quickly find re uh, results for um, diversity in research, diversity in fundraising, diversity in volunteer outreach. So there are a lot of resources out there. Um, finally, we find that uh, on innovation, the effect size for diversity seems to be, uh, it's not huge, it seems to be smaller than some things like uh, how well your team communicates, how cohesive they are, uh, the degree to which innovation is supported on the team. Um, so diversity is not necessarily going to be the thing that uh, either makes or breaks your team. Um, but a lot of us are here at this conference because we're engaged in this uh, problem-solving, creative, innovative work. We're trying to um, convince people to help other people or find solutions to big global problems or stop robots from killing us all. Um, all of which are really, really important and really, really hard. Um, and we're going to need to use all the tools at our disposal, and diversity is one of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgia. Our next speaker on diversity is Julia Wise, who is the community liaison at the Center for Effective Altruism. Welcome, Julia. So uh, I do work at the Center for Effective Altruism, uh, working on various community issues, one of which is um, how does diversity interact with our community? How can we use it to do more good? Uh, how can we improve? So I'm going to start with a few questions. One is, why should we care about diversity? What, what relevance does this have? I think if we want to address big problems in the world, we need all the excellent people we can get. We don't want to miss out on excellent people because they don't feel welcome. And we don't just need excellent people. We need all the knowledge uh, that we can get about how the world works. A narrow demographic uh, on any dimension, like race, gender, age, any of this, uh, is not going to have all the knowledge and experience that we need to change the world. And by default, any group founded in a narrow demographic, um, as EA was, uh, will probably stay within that demographic unless we take intentional steps to change that. And I see this as related to the overall theme of this event of doing good together. We want to make the most of the different skills and experiences that we have and bring in more skills and experiences uh, that will help us do more good uh, that we may not yet have enough of. So some other questions that I think about related to this is how weird should EA be and how should EA be weird? Uh, obviously, EA delves into some ideas that are off the beaten path. It's not every community that gets together to have intense uh, discussions about whether fish suffer and how. Uh, you know, I think this is a real strength of our community. I, I love that about EA, uh, that people are willing to explore ideas and work on projects that others might dismiss. But it's easy to mix up the characteristics that help us do good uh, sometimes in weird ways, with other characteristics that don't really have to do with EA. We should wonder what's going on if everyone who's interested in EA also happens to like the same TV shows, have the same political views, work in the same types of jobs. That might mean that we're filtering for people who seem like us more than people who want to use evidence and reason to do more good. And it may mean that we're missing chances to explore new areas. So. I have a few areas where I, th I think we can improve, uh, with a caveat that I have messed up on some of these. We probably all have. Uh, 
One is being aware of jargon. Jargon can be really helpful. It can help people communicate faster and more in depth. Uh, but it can also be a barrier to new people understanding what on earth we're talking about. Uh, that's not something we want. It doesn't mean we can't use jargon, but it means we should explain and bring people in to what, what it is that we're saying. Uh, nobody wants to be the new person who has to ask, what, what is earning to give? What, what is AMF? Uh, when you're using terms that might not make sense to new people in a mixed group, you explain what you mean. Help them be brought into the conversation. Uh, I think humility is another important uh, way forward here. Two years ago, I interviewed all the EA Global attendees over the age of 40. Uh, there were not many of them. I think age is an area where we're definitely missing opportunities to get more experience and knowledge. Um, one theme that I heard from these folks was that they weren't too keen on what they saw as a know-it-all attitude, especially from people who actually were much less experienced and knowledgeable about than them in many ways. Um, so that's something for us to be aware of. I also think about psychological diversity. Uh, there are a lot of questions about obligation, what our responsibilities are in EA. Uh, and people deal with that sense of obligation in very different ways. Some people use it to really drive their work for years at a time. Uh, other p times it can lead to spinning your wheels while feeling horrible. Uh, I know I've done some of both at different times. And if you find yourself spinning your wheels while feeling horrible, or even if you're getting a lot of work done while feeling horrible, please do what it takes to take care of yourself. We're not going to fix these problems this year. We need people in this for the long term. Uh, and that means not burning out. So please be kind to yourself. If you notice other people having trouble here, try to help them be kind to themselves. And people have different motives for working on altruistic projects. Some people are driven mostly by a fairly abstract sense of what is the right thing to do. Other people have a deep emotional or empathetic drive, a strong feeling of what it is like to suffer or to thrive. Neither of these drives uh, is uh, one that's less compatible with EA. Both can drive work using evidence and reason to do more good. Um, there's no particular reason that EA has to be driven by one or the other. I also think about philosophical diversity. Uh, we're not all utilitarians. We shouldn't be mixing up uh, EA and utilitarianism or treating them as though they're the same thing. Uh, there are lots of ethical tr frameworks that cause people to want to do more good, and um, that's uh, something that we should welcome. There are also differences in participation. The EA survey indicates that more than a third of people in this community say that they participate less because they're worried about not being EA enough. That's a problem. Uh, it's easy to come away, I think, with the impression that everyone else here is doing all the things. They're all vegans with awesome jobs who donate lots of money when they're not too busy writing their EA blog. Uh, that's not realistic for most people. Uh, we want to celebrate the ways that people have an impact but different ways will make sense for different people, and no one is going to do it all. There are also differences in life choices. As the young people in this movement get older, we make choices like how much to save for retirement, whether to have children, whether to buy a house, where to live. Some people come to EA having already made many of these choices. It's good for our ethics to inform how we make decisions, especially important decisions, but EA cannot prescribe a single uniform approach to all these. We need to find ways of making EA work for people in very different life circumstances. So my take home point is that EA can do more of what it's best at, including weird things, if we get more excellent people. So let's be careful not to miss chances to do that. Thank you so much, Julia. That concludes our trio of talks on diversity. Uh, next, we have Malo Borgon, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, or MIRI. Um, as MIRI's COO, Malo uh, oversees all day-to-day -day operations and program activities at MIRI. He also co-chairs the Committee on the Safety and Beneficence of Artificial General Intelligence and Artificial Superintelligence on the IEEE Global Initiative for Ethical Considerations in Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems. Uh, which probably has a really interesting acronym. Uh, <laughs> Malo joined MIRI in 2012, shortly after competing a, completing a master's degree in engineering at the University of Guelph. Please welcome Malo. 
Thanks. Uh, so I'm just going to be giving a quick update on what Miri has been up to since the last time we were here at EAG. Um, I'll spend a little time kind of giving a brief intro to what uh, Miri does, but unfortunately five minutes isn't enough to really get into that, let alone also give an update. Um, we are going to be doing a Q&A, uh, Nate primarily, uh, at 4.45 in breakout route one, which is shortly after this. So if anyone's kind of interested in getting into the nitty gritty details of what Miri is up to, whether it's research questions or strategy and operation, um, I'd encourage uh, you guys to go check that out. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, MIRI, or the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, uh, is an organization based in Berkeley who's been thinking for a while about kind of the long-term questions around uh, the safety of AGI or powerful AI systems. Um, we're particularly focused on doing technical research, and our wheelhouse for kind of the longest time has been really kind of big picture uh, like math, philosophical questions, which things are we really confused about that we don't even know how to kind of do in principle that we think we need to know how to do in order to be able to kind of in practice build these systems in a way that will be more safe. Um, so on the research front, last year we had a couple talks, um, one of which we discussed a new result that we were very excited about in our logical uncertainty uh, research direction called logical inductors. Um, and since then we've kind of been focusing on using the insights from logical inductors and another uh, kind of thing that we developed called reflective oracles and see how those apply to decision theory because we think that there's uh, some kind of nice compatibilities there and so researchers have been spending some time thinking about that. Um, researchers have also been spending a little bit of time thinking about uh, how you can kind of uh, create reasoning processes that don't give rise to adversarial subagents. Um, that probably doesn't mean a lot to many of you, but if you are more interested, you can come to the Q&A and ask more questions about that. Um, another like label we use for that sometimes is honest induction, though. Uh, not sure how committed we are to that. Um, we did announce last year as well a new research agenda, which we call AMLs, or uh, uh, Alignment for Advanced Machine Learning Systems. Um, we've since deprioritized that research uh, due to a combination of the main team that was working on that, uh, departing Miri for various reasons. Um, one example is Critch, who went to found work at Chai. Um, and so uh, we're no longer strictly focused on that, though these questions are obviously all things that we continue to think about. Um, we've since hired four new researchers, so I'm very excited about that. And we've also started doing some new, new research that we're uh, currently not discussing, um, but maybe we will more in the future. Um, for, for some of our research programs, we're more interested in uh, hiring engineers. And so we've currently got six engineering interns that we're currently trialing to see if any of those will be good full-time hires. If you think that you're an exceptional programmer and have some inclination towards ML, uh, I'd strongly encourage you to get in touch with us. I think we still have a listing on intelligence.org slash careers. Uh, we'll you know, very likely do another round of that because we're very interested in hiring um, for some engineering positions. Kind of more on like an outreach comm side of things, um, we're deprioritizing de kind of very broad outreach stuff this year. Uh, but we are spending some time on what I kind of summarize as uh, uh, exchange research informing background models with allies and top AI groups. So Miri, in terms of kind of informing our own decisions, have done a bunch of strategic thinking that we think is important to kind of formalize, write up and share with allies and top AI groups. And so we're currently doing that and I think that's going well. I'm not exactly sure when there might be some public output of that and what that will look like. Um, but I think this is like pretty important work that I'm glad is happening. And then uh, lastly, just kind of a funding update. Um, we, uh, we're doing pretty well on funding. We had a surprise $1 million Ethereum donation that came out of nowhere from one of our uh, donors who's a cryptocurrency investor. So we're really pleased about that, which kind of helped extend our runway to something like uh, 16 to 18 months. Um, with this kind of new research program that we were starting, we were feeling a little bit of concern about having to fund between the two, but I think this kind of new inflow of funding will help us do that. Um, so our goal is uh, to try and raise $3 million this year. Um, we expect that our budget for this year will something be some, somewhere around $2 million, um, but we kind of want to use this as a launching point to try and be a little bit more ambitious with our plans, and this was like a one-time donation, so we can't count on kind of that continuous funding coming through uh, indefinitely. Um, so that's a quick summary of what Miri is up to. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions or like to kind of get into the nitty gritty of any of that, I'd encourage you to come by and uh, talk with Nate and myself uh, at 445 in Breakout Route 1. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks so much, Malo. Uh, our next speaker is Jonathan Courtney. Jonathan Courtney has a Master's of Philosophy from Oxford and is passionate about ethics, both theoretical and applied. He's here representing the Global Priorities Institute. Welcome, Jonathan. Uh, great. So yeah, thanks so much for having me here. I'm here representing the uh, Global Priorities Institute. Uh, the last time you heard about it, it was probably called the Institute for Effective Altruism. Uh, essentially, the goal of this institute, uh, which is being founded by academics at the University of Oxford, uh, is to essentially establish the academic roots uh, of the EA tree. So we want to do top-level academic research that's directly relevant uh, to EA questions, but doing so in a way that is perhaps more in-depth, more academically rigorous than, than our standard uh, EA research tends to be. Uh, and so the uh, I'm going to give really uh, five minutes is not much time, so I'm going to give you a really brief overview of sort of what we're sort of thinking about, the progress we've made over the last year, uh, and what we're hoping to do uh, in the future, and importantly, calls for action for all of you in the audience today uh, to help us out. All right, so quickly, uh, what are we trying to do? Uh, well, the, roughly, the, as I said, the vision and mission of the Institute is to try and uh, extend EA's academic influence uh, and to try and really make uh, EA a force for good in the academic world as well. I and mean, one of the most exciting uh, sort of versions of effective altruism is to think of it as a intellectual movement that's really going to be like the new scientific revolution where, you know, 50 years from now, people are just going to see EA as kind of common sense. And I think part of what the Institute wants to do is to try and provide the academic foundations for that. So that means getting academics uh, who are at top universities to be working on topics rele relevant to EA, to teaching it in classes to undergraduates, uh, and building out a research network that way. Um, so in practical terms, what have we done? Well, uh, in the last year, we've established uh, about a million dollars, uh, and we've established in order to, sorry, a million pounds, in order to get a uh, buyout for a number of the professors we want to fund, and to uh, sort of get things started with the institute. We've bought out Professor Hillary Greaves Times, who's the uh, academic head of the Institute, uh, as well as we've gotten a grant to secure uh, um, Dr. Michelle Hutchison, who used to run Giving What We Can, to do the academic work for the program. And we also uh, got our first researcher, Dr. Andreas Morgensen, who's also at the University of Oxford. Uh, we've developed a expansive research agenda, uh, which I would like to go uh, in more detail and had a bunch of info on the slides, but I'll just do a sort of quick rundown of a few examples of some of the things that we're thinking about right now. So this research uh, agenda is very preliminary and I would love to get individuals feedback on it. If you want to talk to me afterwards, that'd be great. Um, we've basically developed it through having weekly seminars at the University of Oxford where we've invited uh, professors uh, in economics and philosophy as well as uh, individuals at the Future Humanities Research Institute and um, CEA. And we basically are looking for topics that are at the intersection, initially at least, between philosophy and economics. So this is where Professor Greaves' uh, uh, real expertise lies. And uh, a few examples of these uh, include things like, how do we think about economics if we are altruistic? So one of the foundational considerations within economics is the assumption that you're uh, self-interested. So what happens when we take that away? What sort of theoretical implications are there when we're a movement like EA and we have a unified goal? What can we do there theoretically? Uh, thinking about long-term implications of our policy decisions. So often we are thinking about, uh, certainly in development and health, things in the sort of two or five year time scale, but what happens when we have uncertainty about this longer term? What sort of tools can we use from economics and elsewhere to make really uh, you know, deep theoretical conclusions about these things? Uh, we're also really interested, uh, one project that I've been doing a research, uh, sort of helping the literature review on, is to expand the disability and the quality of life years uh, in order to create a, a well-being adjusted life year that can include things like health, uh, not just health, but also education and income, so that we can provide, uh, you know, we can provide a metric that works across a bunch of different policy spaces. Uh, this is a really big, obviously a really big project, and we're working hard to get uh, other uh, academics interested get other people on board. So uh, the main call to actions I'd have for all of you, uh, and we really interested to get your help on, is we really want to get more uh, professors, uh, in, especially initially in economics and philosophy, who are interested in working on uh, EA relevant projects to get in contact with us so we can do collaborative projects. Uh, if you know people who, or you're yourself doing a PhD uh, in economics or philosophy right now, we have a uh, really great opportunity. So one that's coming up this upcoming summer is a uh, uh, sort of research fellowship where you can actually come and work at the Institute uh, for the summer and contribute to our research programs and really get to know the, uh, the community uh, much better. So uh, I really hope you all have the opportunity to help us out in that. And if you have any other questions, I'll be available uh, afterwards to answer them. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Jonathan. Our next speaker is Sebastian Joy. Sebastian Joy is among the most important representatives of the vegetarian and vegan movement in Europe. 
Sebastian is the CEO of Vibu, a leading European pro-vegan organization. Welcome, Sebastian. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, well, that was a bit of an old CV. I also teach at the Berlin School of Economics and Law, uh, Nonprofit Management, and our organization nowadays is called Provech International. Uh, today, I would like to talk about one of the disadvantages how uh, the EA movement approaches how to uh, make the world the most better case and what's one way of uh, resolving that trouble. Um, if we look at, I mean, our EA is all about making the world a better place. Who is here to make the world a better place? Can you? Yeah, that should, more than half I would say. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay. And usually how we go about it, you know, we look at the world and we look, okay, where are the biggest problems? And then, you know, for example, traditionally we come up with, for example, like global poverty. Okay, really big problem. Animal suffering, big problem. Existential risk, big problem, or any other cause. The next thing we do is we say, okay, we want to solve, like, for example, global poverty. So we really want to look into that. So we create, for example, like a meta charity, like Give Well. We do this in other causes, you know, animal charity value does for animal suffering, you know, existential risk, or other causes, any kind of meta charity. And then that meta charity digs into what are the best, like, you know, NGOs and interventions to solve that particular problem. And we know that in all, in all these kind of, um, Areas, and this is this has been very successful so far. I mean, you know, we're really making a lot of progress in each of those areas. But let let's look at one example. Let me, yeah, because this what you can already see. It's already very siloed. You know, so you look at the problem, you look at the meta charity, and then you look at the intervention. Now, let me give you one example. If we have those silos, and we have like cause A on the left, and then we have all the different interventions that you can do there. So you have like interventions one, two, three, all the way down to 10. And the, the percentage that's like the most effective intervention we can do for that cause. So the red one, for example, I mean, that's the best one, that's why it's number one, and then intervention Y is only 90% as effective as uh, intervention X. And then, for example, we have intervention Z, number four, or Z, uh, which is like 70%. Now, you know, usually we would say, okay, let's focus, you know, the top two or three uh, interventions. Now, let's look at another cause. Let's look, let's say cause B. So that's a totally different cause, so probably the first, all the first interventions that they are, you know, they're not, they, they have no relation with cause A. But it's quite likely that there might be that intervention X that we had in cause A, like, or, like that this does not have any impact on cause B. So it's zero percent. But for example, it could be possible that intervention Y, which had 90% on the left, suddenly actually has a negative impact in cause B. Which for example is called like, I mean, one example is the, uh, the poor meat eaters dilemma, where you know, they say if more people are, you know, there's a quite a correlation between wealth and uh, consumption of animals. So if we get, uh, you know, get the poor out of poverty, that might increase the numbers of animals being eaten. That's one example. And then you can also have the example like you see with intervention Z, Z, like which is number four in cause A, but still has like a 30% of positive impact in relation to that best uh, intervention in cause B. And then that goes on, you know, you have maybe another thing and that's maybe how it's listed. Now, if you combine all of that, <clears throat> you will see you know, that that's what I call intercausal impact, that suddenly, like intervention number C, which has never been in the top three of either cause, but is, you know, at least somewhat up on cause number one, uh, A, and then like, you know, not really bad and having some impact on cause on B and C, suddenly, I mean, you cannot really add them up in percentage, you know, because it's totally different causes, but just like on a mathematical perspective, that you suddenly have an intervention that's really, really attractive, and that's really doing a lot of good, even though it might not be in the top of any of the causes that we've looked at. And that's basically, uh, this is, you know, that's one example how we might be missing out on some interventions uh, if we approach it like the way we do at the moment by, you know, focusing mainly on cause areas and looking within that cause. Um, so, and one example, you know, what I'm getting at is, if, is the high consumption of animal products. Now, this has a lot of implications. For example, in animal suffering, 95% of human-made animal suffering is due to high consumption of animal products. Climate change, depending on the study, between 30 and 
51%, rainforest destruction, 80 to 90%, biodiversity, probably more than 80%, freshwater consumption, 20 to, uh, 20 to 33%, world hunger, I mean, it's put in about a third of the world harvest, is not being fed to people, but animals, which is quite inefficient, human health, health-related costs are a third of them are diet-related, epidemics, I mean, it's not 80% of the epidemics, but it's important to know that 80% of the antibiotics used are used for animals. Moral values, like Peter Singer argues, uh, that speciesism, carnism, sexism, racism, like, you know, have some con connection denominator. So, and because of all these connections, we actually believe that promoting a more plant-based diet or moving towards it has a lot of positive impact, which is often underestimated, and this is why we have created a movement and organization which is called ProVeg, or the organization is called ProVeg International, which is a food awareness movement with the mission to reduce global consumption of animal products by 50% by 2040. Uh, we, ha we do have a lot of impact within the animal realm. That is also why Animal Charity Valuator rates us as a standout charity. Nevertheless, I would actually argue that we only, I mean, as I just pointed out, not only have an impact on, for animals, but on many, many other issues. And this is why I think it's really important to focus on that project. Um, so if everybody, uh, yeah, well, yeah, that briefly to sum that up. So our main strategy, I don't have too much time to explain what we're all doing, but it is, uh, it always comes down to what we call influencing the influencers. So we look at the important target groups that determine society, whether it's like the food industry, the media, policymakers, medicine and research, or related NGOs. And then we try to look, look within the target group, to find out who are the market leaders that the others follow and try to influence those. And we have been quite successful, as you can see by... Uh, ACES uh, rating. So, okay, I'm coming to an end. Um, that is our team. Uh, we are mainly based in Berlin, looking for great people who want to join, who believe in our mission. Uh, so I still have office hours later on the other side, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, our last speaker for this round of lightning talks uh, will be speaking about the Berkeley Initiative for Tech Transparency in the Social Sciences, or BITS, which works to strengthen the integrity of social science research and evidence used for policymaking. Welcome. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kelsey Mulcahy. I'm the program manager of BITS. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm really inspired by all the talks today and I think that um, BITS has a lot to contribute here. Uh, and so I'll tell you a little bit about what we do and then maybe a, a little bit about the resources that we have available um, online. Um, so BITS was founded as an initiative of the Center for Effective Global Action at UC Berkeley. Um, and so what we're aiming to do is strengthen the evidence base. Uh, so this is, you know, talking about research and the quality of research that is used to then drive policy making. Um, and so you may have heard of the replication crisis in like the last 10 years or so. Um, so there are, you know, major studies that aren't, um, you know, being replicated and, you know, people can't find the same results when they do the study again. Um, and this could be because of scientific misconduct or this could just be because of researchers' mistakes. Uh, everyone makes mistakes. Uh, so there have been some high-profile retractions in the last few years, um, including Michael LaCour. Uh, and so BITS was really founded as, as a way to kind of address these issues. Like, what can we do to make science better? Um, and so in, in 2012, which was when we were um, started at SIGA, uh, we were thinking about how we can address these issues. And uh, I'll talk about just a few uh, here today. Uh, so the first is through education and training. And so thinking about, okay, the next generation of researchers, you know, will need to leverage new technology, new tools, uh, software to be able to um, improve their research and integrate transparency into their research practices. And so what we've tried to do is develop curriculum that can be incorporated into classes 
you know, existing methods classes, um, you know, all over the country and the world, uh, as well as doing our own trainings. And so BITS will, will fly to many countries around the world and do trainings with um, organizations uh, like INSP in Mexico, JPAL in India, um, as well as uh, in Africa and Europe as well. Um, and then the other half is that we're trying to model kind of a train the trainer program. And so we have a catalyst network around the world where people you know, attend one of our trainings and then we hope that they can then go on and train others in their home institution. Uh, so both researchers and uh, research practitioners uh, have joined our network to kind of you know, train others in, in their um, host institution. Um, so, you know, and then that's kind of the in-person training aspect. And then we've also developed an online course on research transparency. Um, so we have a MOOC on the Future Learn platform that if you're interested in learning more, uh, you can go um, take this three-week course that's free and we'll pr provide a really good overview of, um, you know, the movement and as well as some of the tools and software that you can use um, in your own, own research practice. Um, so education and training is, is the first kind of thing that we're focusing on as a solution. Uh, the second is research. So BITS does some of its own research um, as well as funds other people to do research. So this is thinking about research practices and how we can make them more transparent um, you know, with the end goal of a more robust uh, research base. Uh, so our SMART grant program is about 22 research projects that are competitively selected and funded by BITS. Uh, they look at everything from, um, you know, developing uh, or looking at uh, research attitudes and practice uh, in different uh, places around the world, uh, as well as, um, you know, doing new meta-analyses and developing new tools and softwares to kind of assist with uh, research transparency. Uh, so those are the, our smart grants. And then we have BITS-led research, uh, which is looking at things like data citations and, um, you know, researcher attitudes and behaviors uh, over time. Um, and so, you know, we, we hope that by coupling the training with the research will be able to kind of help researchers from multiple angles. Uh, and then the third that I'll just briefly mention is incentives. So we hope that through uh, cash prizes, we'll be able to reward people who are doing really good work in this space. Uh, so the leaders that are kind of advancing the open science and research transparency movement. Uh, and this is kind of based off of the work by Ed Lemer and Bob Rosenthal. Uh, so the prizes are called the Lima Rosenthal Prizes for Open Social Science. And so there are about 30 researchers or so that have really advanced research transparency over the last few years. And those are the people that we kind of recognize and um, hope to inspire younger researchers to do the same. Um, so you can find more information at bits.org. Uh, I'll be around at office hours to answer more questions if anyone's interested. Thanks. <laughs>